so hello everyone a very warm good afternoon to one and all present here myself rahul chakish chandra mittal and i am going to be your moderator for the session with immense pleasure i would like to welcome all of you to the emergency medicine trauma care and disaster management workshop so let me begin by introducing our first speaker of the day that is dr lucas certain sir who is the medical director of samu 192 regional brazil he is currently working at hcfm usp which is the largest health complex in latin america professional and reference book on emergency medicine in country linked to university of sao paulo research training and assistance He is also interested in three hospital and ultra ultrasound point of care, cardiology emergency, emergency management, and teaching. We are really honored, sir, to have you on board with us for today's session. So, without wasting any further time, let's get started. Over to you, sir. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to me uh, talking with you guys uh, this morning here in Brazil. Uh, so let me use my presentation to talk with us. Just a second. Can you see my? My slide? Yes, sir. yes, sir. it's visible. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Lucas Sertan. Uh, I'm a doctor in Brazil. Uh, I'm an emergency physician here. I have been working with pre-hospital uh, during the last uh, seven years, and we are uh, talking uh, the to trauma uh, and trauma care here this morning in Brazil. Uh, this is a picture of one of my observerships. I did uh, two observerships in United States, uh, one uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and another in Boston. Uh, this picture is with Boston MedFlight, an uh, important uh, institution in pre-hospital care uh, in Boston City. I... Uh, visited uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and Sydney, Australia also. And I have a huge interest in, in pre-hospital care. So uh, trauma is a illness. It's an important uh, leading cause of death uh, in subdeveloped countries like Brazil. Uh, I think India has... Uh, a huge amount of trauma as well. And we have a host and we have a vector. Host, it's uh, uh, the, the patient, the victim, and the vector, it's a bike, a motor vehicle, a bus, a, a car, a gun, a knife. In this picture, uh, we can see a patient with a knife, uh, a knife in his dorsal. And we are uh, assisting uh, he, uh, him to, to an emergent hospital. So it's an uh, important cause of death, injuries, uh, disabilities in the future. We have a lot of cause of preventable death uh, when we talk with trauma. 6% of the preventable death uh, is caused by hemorrhage, 13% is tensile pneumothorax, 10% cardiac tamponade, and 7% airway obstruction. Uh, the trauma unit is uh, relationate with alcohol, drugs exposure, violence, uh, disruption of the law, and especially high speed uh, problems, but uh, hemorrhage, tensile pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, airway obstruction, it's preventable cause of death in trauma, mainly hemorrhage. So in trauma, we have priorities. Uh, the, the last edition, the ninth edition of PATLS, it's an important book that we use in trauma per hospital care. Uh, 
uh, there's a minimum uh, X, A, B, C, D that control external uncontrolled hemorrhage. It's a uh, number one priority. Uh, we need to open and protection the area with spine motion restriction as well. Uh, nowadays, we don't say spine motion immobilization. Uh, immobilization, 100% the, the spine is, um, is not uh, a woman being um, uh, we can do this with a woman being techniques nowadays. So uh, we need to, to say spine motion restriction and no immobilization. Uh, we need to support the patient, uh, uh, promote a good ventilation oxygenation. And finally, we need to access uh, like a IV or IO access with fluid and blood resuscitation. This is the the main priorities uh, on trauma care, mainly in pre-hospital care. This is uh, something that we don't need to, to see. Uh, it's an uh, accident with our ambulance, not uh, a direct ambulance, not my crew, uh, but uh, we don't need to, to see this. Uh, we have to uh, uh, to secure the scene, <clears throat> secure, uh, we need to have security for the crew, for the patient, and don't um, need uh, a rescue for another team, for example. Uh, to start, uh, the, the first priority is the exsanguination. Uh, today, we have an international campaign, Stop the Bleed, that recommends the early use of tourniquet, for example, to stop uh, the, the uh, amount of blood loss, for example. Uh, we can uh, have kits uh, of tourniquets uh, in uh, public space, for example, and we need to use this uh, very early to stop the, the bleed. Uh, I don't talk in uh, F of fracture. Uh, I don't say in uh, uh, S of uh, sanguination, but I am talking to X of X sanguination. Uh, it's a, a large amount of blood loss, okay? I think. Okay, this is a picture of the Boston Marathon in uh, 2013. Uh, we have this incident in Boston, Massachusetts. And you can see in this picture um, a photo of uh, a patient using a tourniquet on your uh, left leg. So the, the main uh, save life uh, equipment here, it's a tourniquet. They don't, uh, he doesn't need a cervical collar, uh, IV or IO access uh, in this case, but he, he has a, a great uh, protect, protective uh, member uh, that is uh, the tourniquet. Here, a paramedic, a person who, who was helping the patient as well. Uh, when we talk about airway, we have airway maneuvers like jaw thrush. We need to open and protect this airway. Uh, we, don't, um, we don't do a chin lift uh, on trauma patient because we need to protect uh, his spine, but we can open the airway using, uh, for example, the jaw thrust maneuver. Uh, to maintain the open airway, we can use uh, some device like the oropharyngeal uh, equipment, uh, also called uh, Gedel uh, equipment. 
uh, we have the main, we have other examples for the laryngeal mask, uh, endotube, uh, endotracheal tube, uh, tracheal tube to maintain and protect this airway. Airway is one of the, the critical uh, maneuvers in trauma victims. For briefing, we have, uh, for example, uh, uh, no rebriefing mask that can uh, uh, oxygenate the patient 100%, for example. So we need to offer uh, ventilation and oxygenation for this patient. We can do uh, also some uh, procedures, medical procedures uh, here in Brazil, like uh, torcosynthesis. Uh, you can use a needle to insert uh, and alleviate uh, tensile pneumothorax, for example. We can uh, also do a torcotomy uh, using a finger, uh, finger torcotomy, or using a chest tube. And finally, we can use a uh, occlusive dressing, uh, at three or four sites occlusive dressing to treat uh, open pneumothorax. Uh, tensor pneumothorax and open pneumothorax are causing of uh, depths in trauma. And it's uh, a priority as well as uh, pre uh, prevent hemorrhages and to open and protect the, the area. For example, in C we have circulation. Uh, in at this time we need to cannulate uh, a vein, or uh, we need we can use uh, IO access. Uh, and at this point we can use a uh, BIG uh, device or ISIO device. Here it's a BIG big device. For example. Uh, we can uh, insert this to uh, administrate fluids, uh, sal sal uh, saline, for example, but we can use uh, blood products as well. And for open uh, trauma in pelvis, uh, not open, but unstable uh, trauma uh, to pelvis, we can use like bed sheet or commercial device like this. This is a sling uh, to uh, use in open um, fractures, open book fractures to pelvis. Um, trauma in pelvis can cause uh, a huge amount of blood loss, but no external blood loss, but internal blood loss. This is a picture from um, uh, a service of England that uh, they have helicopters, uh, motor vehicles, and finally they have blood, product, blood products to administer to their victims. Here in Brazil, we have uh, also blood products. Uh, we have normal saline and we have erythrocytes to administer for our trauma victims. It's uh, the standard care of trauma, uh, of pre-hospital trauma. Um, the, the new guidelines and recommendations uh, uh, recommends uh, the use of early and aggressive uh, blood products, uh, rather than uh, normal saline or uh, ringer lactate. In D, we are exam the disability. Uh, we do a rapid neurologic exam using, for example, Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, we are examining eye opening, verbal response, and motor response of the patient. We can see uh, another signs like this one is the wrecking. Uh, eyes or raccoon uh, sign, a uh, battle sign that rep uh, represents a uh, basilar skull fracture, for example. And in the, this last picture, we can see uh, uh, different pupils. Uh, uh, the right is different than the left pupil. 
that represents uh, brain herniation. It's a uh, emergency neuro uh, neurosurgery um, uh, situation that requires uh, immediate uh, loss or reduction uh, the uh, pressure in inside the this queue and neurosurgery. In e, we are doing exposure to the patient. We are looking for small injuries, fractures, and finally we are using the aluminum fabric to avoid uh, hypothermia, for example. And uh, after all this first uh, survey, we are doing the secondary survey using the mnemonic sample uh, that we are uh, looking for other uh, information about the patient, like symptoms, allergies, uh, medications, past medical history, uh, last oral intake, and events uh, during the, this trauma. So this is uh, uh, just uh, what is the most important in uh, primary and secondary serving uh, during the trauma uh, care. And I think I, think I, uh, uh, I could uh, uh, help you, uh, you with this uh, presentation. So thanks a lot, uh, and Ricardo will do the last, uh, the uh, second presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, sir, for really amazing session, and that was really informative. We came to know uh, many things about emergency medicine and disaster management. Yeah. So with this, with this now, let, let me introduce our next, next speaker for the day, that is Dr. Ricardo, sir, who is specialist in emergency medicine, general surgery, and gastrointestinal surgery. He has been also an instructor at Advanced Trauma Life Support, Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Support. He also has been a supervisor at Emergency Medicine in Medical Residency Hospital, Brazil, and has been a former director of Education, Research, and Training Division at GREU. With so much experience in the field of emergency medicine and disaster management, it's a great pleasure having you, sir, for today's session. Sir is going to share his valuable knowledge about the, about the emergency medicine and disaster management. So without wasting any further time, let's start the session. Over to you, sir. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you are audible. Okay, thank you. I'll start sharing my screen now, okay. Right, can everybody see this? Yeah, so your screen is visible. Okay, so let's get started with uh, disaster medicine. Here's a, a brief curriculum of mine. Uh, as you said, I am an emergency medicine doctor working mostly with pre-hospital emergency care here in, in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I have been uh, to several uh, disaster sites and disaster relief uh, and management, okay. So let's start with the definitions, some definitions of uh, disasters or uh, mass casualty incidents. Uh, we have uh, several definitions, several different definitions of MCI, uh, but uh, mostly it means that a mass casualty incident is an event capable of generating a number of victims big enough to disorganize or interrupt local health services or local health system, right? It doesn't depend on the number of victims 
uh, it's, it's it's related to the to the to the problem that it causes in the health in the local health system, right? And also, we have a situation in which uh, always the demand for resources is bigger than the availability of resources itself, okay? There are many causes to the disasters. Some of them or most of them are natural causes like floods in this picture in the in left. It, it, it's a rail, it's a train uh, rail that was destroyed from a, from a flood in Brazil. And in the right side, right picture, you can see uh, several landslides which uh, happened here in Brazil also. These two events I have been to, uh, I, I partici participated in this, these two events in these pictures. Also, we have uh, disasters caused by man. Uh, and for example, this uh, huge fire in an oil refinery uh, that happened some years ago here in Brazil. And in disasters, we, we can have a lot of uh, different scenarios. They can be related to biological warfare or, bi or biological uh, problems, landslides, floods, explosions, nuclear disasters, chemical trauma, and um, many other major events. So we have to be prepared for any kind of situation. And disasters, they happen in every place in the world, like from the US when they had this uh, huge floods in, in the south of the United States in 2000, 2005, Haiti, in 2010, uh, an earthquake, and also in Antarctica. And so the five continents have disasters, right? This one was a fire in the Brazilian Antarctic station in 2012. So we have to try to standardize our approach to disasters and these are the five basic steps that we have to follow. First of all, we have to establish an incident command system. Then we have the search and rescue phase, the triage of the victims and medical care and evacuation. So the incident command system, it is an organizational structure, not, uh, it is not, related to the physical structure. It's a, it's a form, it's a manner of, uh, that you have to organize your team, right? In, in a manner that we, we can use a common language in which everybody understands what everybody's saying. Uh, we have interaction between several agencies like fire department, police, the armed forces and, and also the ambulance system and many others. It is expendable. You can uh, put many people together and then you can uh, withdraw the, some people as uh, the disaster gets uh, lower off in, in, in size, okay? And we can apply this to any type of mass casualty incident, this concept of incident command system. We have a basic structure, which uh, is composed of an incident commander, a liaison officer, which uh, is the guy that talks to every agency and uh, makes the connection between them. We have the safety officer, which is uh, the guy that um wants to the he, he takes care of the safety of everybody we have information officer which is the guy that talks to the press and to the families right and then we have operations sex section planning section logistics and finances 
These are some examples of the incident command of a uh, mobile incident command system that we use here in Brazil. It is located in a in a large truck, and we can take it to wherever it it is needed. Right. So this picture in the left, it's it is from the Formula One race in Brazil. The other one in the right is from uh, World FIFA Cup, Soccer Cup. Uh, we can use it mostly everywhere. This other one is from a uh, landslide uh, disaster that happened in south of Brazil in 2008. Also, the, the incident command system can be uh, arranged or can be organized in mostly every space that you can have. This is a, another example of, the, of an incident command system. This is in Rio de Janeiro. And, and you can see the people there and th there's this table and people are organizing things. That's an incident command system. So just, for, just to show you that you don't need to have a fancy big truck as uh, a place uh, to, to put your incident command system, right? Another example here, we, we had uh, floods in, in the state of Sao Paulo in this year 2010, and we, we established uh, a command post in a, in a house of, that people uh, let us use this house. So this here, it is written command post right here, okay? So the second phase is search and rescue, and we have to have uh, specialized teams like firefighters and also the armed forces, medical teams specialized in urban search and rescue. And also we, we have to use these rescue dogs most of the time. Just to show you that we have some international uh, regulations on urban search and rescue. This is from the United Nations. It, it is the INSARAG, the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group. If you have uh, curiosity, you can, you can find this in the, on the internet. And you can see that um, it is meant to have, like you see here, medical doctor in the team. So we have to have uh, doctors and also dogs uh, to care uh, or to look for the victims, right? Also, it is very interesting that uh, the dogs, the, the doctors must take care of the dogs also, not only uh, uh, people, right? And this is some pictures of our training in urban search and rescue. And we have, I, I have been to this uh, training some years ago. Uh, it is very tough and because we have this real uh, disasters like this one was one was a, a building collapse here in Sao Paulo. So we have to be right in the middle of the hot zone. So we have to have this training. You can see the victim right under there. This other one was an explosion. Uh, a gas leak uh, in a community here in Sao Paulo uh, and an explosion and a blast. And we, we managed to save a little child from the debris. These are the, our rescue dogs. They, they work with us in most every uh, mass casualty incident. They are very useful for for us to, to find people under the breeze and, and when a building collapse or a landslide. Then we have the triage of the victims, right? We have different levels of triage. Um, we can start a triage. We, we don't have to, to stick with, uh, with a protocol and we, we can have different types of triage. Like, uh, first of all, when the 
the incident starts, we can go there and say, uh, hey, everybody that can walk, please go to this corner and the other ones that cannot walk, we can start triaging them. And this is a, a way of doing a, a, a first triage. And it is a dynamic process because people can get worse of their condition. So we have to redo our triage from time to time. And we have, we have to re-triage people because they can get worse or they can get better. And then we, we can change their uh, level of, uh, of triage and maybe we can change the priority of transport for these victims. And we have different techniques all over the world, but uh, I'll show you one of uh, the most common that we use. And mostly the importance of triage is to separate uh, people that are critical from the non-critical uh, cases. So we have to, to act and to, to do, to do this uh, life-saving interventions in these critical patients. We have to transport them first and then the non-critical we take care afterwards. So mostly 10 to uh, most 25, not more than this uh, of the victims are critical, right? So for our triage, we almost uh, every time we use this uh, start method, which means simple triage and rapid treatment, which mostly uh, evaluates the, the ABCD of the patient, right? So everybody that is walking uh, is classified as a minor trauma. So we can put them all in a far corner so everybody that is walking, we, we put them in the green zone so they can wait for us to see the other patients. And then we go, them, we go there and see them, okay? So in this start triage, we evaluate respirations, we evaluate um, perfusion and mental status. Respiration, uh, breathing, perfusion, mental, mental status, which is mostly the ABCD of trauma, okay? And uh, a good uh, way of remembering this is like this 32 can do, which is almost a rhyme for you to uh, not forget wh what you have to evaluate, okay? And then you put these cards in every patient that you have uh, performed the triage and you can classify him as a green patient, a yellow one, uh, a red one, or this black one, which is uh, a deceased patient, which is already uh, dead when you evaluate him. And this is the priority of transport. The red ones go first, the, yellows, the yellow ones, second and maybe the green ones, maybe they even won't have to go to the hospital, okay? So we have uh, errors that are expected to happen and many times they happen. So under triage is about 5%, which under triage means that you uh, classify a patient that is uh, as a non-critical, but he is actually critical. And the over triage is the opposite. When you classify uh, a patient as a critical one, but he is not critical, he's a light one, right? And over triage happens much, much more often. Uh, you can reach up to 50% of over triage errors in uh, a mass casualty incident. It is expected to, to happen. So the fourth step is medical care, which can be done on scene, on medical stations, and also in mobile hospitals. And here we have to, to 
change our paradigm, our way of thinking, because in med school, uh, the usual medical care that we learn is that you have to do the best for each one and every patient, right? You can see here in this picture, it is one patient and we have more than 10 people working on this patient. He, he was ran over by a train and here in a regular situation, you, you do everything you can and every resource you have, you apply to this patient. But when you have a mass casualty incident, you have to think like this, I have to do the best for as many people as possible. It is a different way of thinking, right? You have to do the best for as many people as possible. So you can look here in these pictures that are from, the left one is from a uh, landslide in, in Brazil and the right one is from the earthquake in Haiti. And you can see not everybody is receiving the best medical treatment, but many people are receiving medical treatment. So this is uh, the way that we have to think, okay? We have on-scene medical care, right? In the hot zone, like this one, and a fire, and, uh, and we had uh, some firemen that were uh, injured. And we have this medical team here. You, you can see our medical crew, the doctor and the nurse in, in this orange cape. And, taking care of the, the firemen that were injured on scene, right beside the fire itself, okay? We have the medical stations, the medical advanced medical posts that we can, uh, we can uh, like put them wherever we want. This is an example when we had the Olympic games here in Brazil. And medical stations also uh, this this structure here in these pictures they are inside this huge building which is just beside the soccer stadium right here okay and also we have the mobile hospitals that can be put uh, together and we can have uh, icus in mobile hospitals we can have uh, uh, or operating rooms, okay, a, a CT scan, a mobile CT scan, also improvised mobile hospitals here. This one was in Brazil. And finally, we have the evacuation. We, we can use ground ambulances. This is a, a mass casualty incident uh, training procedure. We have, we, we can use trained in, we have used this in Brazil and in the World Cup and the Olympic Games. We, we, we prepared this train as, a, as an ambulance train, train to, to take the victim, victims if we had to, right? We can use airplanes. We can, use, uh, we can uh, arrange an ICU in, the, in an airplane. We can use also helicopters to evacuate uh, people. Here in Sao Paulo, we have this uh, more uh, uh, smaller helicopters, but we can use them also in mass casualty incidents and disasters. And I'll show you this video right now. Please tell me if uh, there's any problem for you to see it. Uh, I'll Show in another way, okay. All of these images are from uh, disasters in Brazil, okay.
sir is it having any audio sir Okay, so that's all for this presentation. I uh, hope you have uh, enjoyed it. And now we're open to questions, right? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir, for such an enlightening and informative session. We owe, we owe a special vote of thanks to you, sir, for taking out time from your busy schedule for us. Thank you so much, sir. So we have got a few questions. So first question is how how the clash between social and medical ethics is dealt with when treating in an emergency scenario. Sorry, can you can you ask again, please? Yeah, sure. How the clash between so social and medical ethics is dealt with when treating in an emergency scenario. So uh, the the question is about the the ethical issues, right? Yeah, social and okay. ethical issues. Yeah. Okay. And here we, in Brazil, uh, we have this, um, we have the public health system, right? So here in Brazil, in theory, everybody has the right to receive medical treatment in, in every uh, social condition or every uh, finance, financial condition, right? So we have this, this, uh, all these pictures that I showed you, um, the rescue teams, and they are uh, from public services. They are for free, right? So everybody has the right to receive it and we, they are free of charge. We don't charge anyone from, from this. And, and also we don't, uh, we don't have any separation or any distinction from uh, religion or, or social class, right? Everybody, is treated all the same. So here in Brazil, it is very clear that uh, we can treat uh, 
a very poor guy or a very rich guy or doesn't matter. Everybody gets treated the same way, okay? I, I don't think it, if, I, if I answered you, what, what you, you had question. Thanks a lot. That answers the question. Thanks a lot. Okay. So the second question is, is there any special postgraduate training program in emergency medicine and critical care medicine? Space for foreign students. So, special postgraduate training program. Is there any special postgraduate training program available in emergency medicine and critical care medicine? Yes, we have a special training. We have a medical residency in, in emergency medicine here in Brazil. We have a medical residency, and but uh, for the pre-hospital and disaster medicine, we don't have uh, any fellowships or specialized training available yet, right? Everybody uh, like me and Lucas, we have trained with the fire departments, we have trained with uh, some rescue teams and we, we have trained uh, mostly we, we get our train from, uh, we have to go after this, right? We don't have a, a formal uh, program for disaster and, and pre-hospital medicine, okay? We, for emergency medicine, we have the medical residency, but for disaster and pre-hospital, uh, not yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. So we have an, another question. Admits this pandemic, we have faced multiple natural disaster and at the rate at which environment is destroying, it will definitely get worse. What measure do you think can be taken to salvage lives? Uh, okay, can you, can you ask again, please? <laughs> yeah. Admits this pandemic, we have faced multiple natural disasters and the rate at which environment is destroying, it will definitely get worse. What measure do you think can be taken to salvage lives? So we have, uh, I think the, the, the question is about uh, triage, triage patients, yeah. right? Okay. It's about like natural disaster and the environment is getting, like we are losing environment. So how can we salvage the life in this pandemic? It, it is very difficult, this, this topic in disaster medicine, because... Um, okay. We have uh, we have to do as I said. We have to try to do the best for uh, ma as many people as possible. So, so sometimes uh, people can get worse, and we will not uh, spend our all of our resources in this person, right? And sometimes even they can dump their wounds, and we won't be able to do anything about it because we have to care for another person or so 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 many other persons so we have this this is a very difficult choice for us to make sometimes we have to to leave a, a very critical patient uh, in order to treat another one that is not so critical but we have a uh, uh, more chances to to get him uh, a good treatment than the other one that is very very critical and almost dying and we maybe we would spend more time and resources resources in this uh, very critical patient so we have to choose to leave this this guy and and see him afterwards and it is a very difficult uh, process and it you can also ask uh, questions about ethics, right? And but it is a mass casualty incident, so you have to think differently. You cannot think as you were in a regular hospital, okay? And this is sometimes we have to to choose. We have to choose between two victims, and maybe you have to leave the most critical uh, aside. And then you have to treat the, the the one that is less critical because he has more chances to 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 survive. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your amazing answer. So now we have got one question for Lucas, sir. 
Okay. Uh, so what are your constant source of motivation and positivity as we know that being from such a field it's not always possible to maintain one's calmness and positivity so what are your source of motivation and positivity uh, sources my... of motivation and positivity okay yes, to, to do my job <laughs> yeah i think it is the question yeah. <laughs> okay great uh, so uh, in emergency uh, medicine uh, I think we have the patient in our hand. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there isn't another specialty in medicine that you can uh, help a woman being like in emergency medicine. Um, uh, you, you can do um, a difference in, in, uh, in that patient's life, for example, uh, you uh, you can save him from uh, uh, a hard situation like a mass casualty, for example. You can help him uh, during a heart attack, uh, during a stroke, during a, um, a, a respiratory failure. Uh, so uh, the motivation is helping uh, uh, them and uh, expect the, the, the discharge from hospital uh, after the, the treatment. Um, I'm very happy uh, to save lives and to, to be an emergency physician. Thanks a lot, sir, for an amazing answer. <laughs> Thank so, you. Next question is, during a mass disaster, it is a challenge to control the communicable disease like typhoid or tuberculosis. What should be the approach for this? Yes, this is a very, uh, very good question. And we, we, are, we have this concern of communicable diseases. It is very difficult for us to deal with it because we don't have many, many, most of the time we don't have uh, basic water supply and and soon nah, and and also uh if we we are facing uh like a biological warfare maybe we we can we must use all the personal protective equipment and so we most of the time we try to do this but it's very difficult for us to to be in the right standards of, of protection. And so the communicable diseases there, they happen and they, they happen uh, very often and people get sick and also the responders get sick very often. And we have to, to deal with it. And we have also to plan that, we had to think that maybe some of the responders will get sick. So we, our teams, we get, uh, we, we take with us uh, to the site, to the, to the disaster site. We take everything we need uh, as uh, from toilet paper to drinkable water, right? We have to, to take everything with us. We don't, we, we, we cannot do, uh, we, we cannot uh, expect that in the disaster site, we will find this. So we have to take with us from our base, okay? And, and also the protective uh, equipment also. Thanks a lot, sir. So I want to ask that, uh, what are your, some of the good and bitter experience that you, held, that you had in this field of emergency medicine while working? For me? Oh, this is for, for, for both. both. For both, okay. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I think, as Lucas said, emergency medicine is a very uh, is a very passionable medical uh, specialty because we we can uh, treat a patient and we can see the result immediately. Okay, so this is uh, this is very uh, good for us that uh, we 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 like to to do things fast and not fast doesn't mean that you are in a hurry okay you have you have to do 
things fast, but uh, thinking about it, okay, and we ha you have to be prepared for uh, many different situations. This is a uh, very good. You, you don't have like a routine. Every each day is a different day, and you can treat a, a child. You can treat a pregnant woman. You can treat a, a trauma and also medical emergencies. So it's a very wide, broad of 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 uh, diseases that you that you treat, and I think the the speed and the, the 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 things that you do, you can see the result uh, right afterwards. And this is very uh, this is uh, what we we like most in emergency medicine. Thanks a lot, sir. Lukasa, what are your views about this? Yeah, sure. What are your good and better experience in the field? Perfect. Uh, the ASAP, uh, it's an uh, emergent physician association in the United States. They have a slogan that say anyone, anytime, anytime. So uh, it's uh, about, uh, Ricardo said, uh, we can treat uh, a child, uh, an elderly person um, in uh, any situation, trauma, medical, uh, emergency medical uh, condition. And it's very uh, interesting. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to have uh, this, uh, we, we can save life in pre-hospital or in intra-hospital setting. Uh, it's very pleasure to do this. Thanks a lot, sir. So, one last question. What are your advices to young aspiring medicals who to take this as a career, emergency medicine and disaster management as a career? Sorry. Sorry, Sorry can you I have problems. Any advices to young expiring? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Any advice? I think uh, if you like uh, adrenaline, right? If you like the rush of uh, of the 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 emotion of uh, treating people fast in a critical condition, you have to do emergency medicine, right? Uh, most of I think it is. If you if you're into like uh, adrenaline, if you have, if you like uh, action, then go to emergency medicine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, sir. So seems like we have come to an end of a quite an interesting session, and sir, we had a great time. Hope all of right. you have enjoyed the workshop and we will again like to thank Dr. Ricardo and Dr. Lucas sir for giving time to us from their busy schedule and sharing their valuable knowledge with us. So again, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, I thank you very much. And if you want to, to send me any more questions, feel free to, to ask me in my email, right? If you, if you, if you want, you can, uh, you can share my email address with everyone in this uh, room, okay? Yes. And yeah, thank sir. you very much again. Okay. Sure. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Sir, yeah, we, need to, so we, we need to take a...